Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. Formalized under the so-called ANZUS Treaty in 1951, the military alliance between Australia and the US has long defined Australia's role in the security context of the Asia-Pacific region. Formalized in the wake of World War II when memories of Japanese aggression were still fresh in the minds of Australians, it was invoked most prominently during Australia's commitment of over 60,000 troops in the Vietnam War from 1962 to 1975. Even given these decades of cooperation, however, it still took many by surprise when it was announced last year at a joint press conference by Obama and Australian Prime Minister Gillard that that alliance was about to be deepened and expanded with the deployment of a permanent U.S. Marine presence in Darwin, Australia. It is an, a new agreement to expand the existing collaboration between the Australian Defence Force and the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Air Force. What this means in very practical detail is from mid-2012, Australia will welcome deployments of a company-sized rotation of 200 to 250 Marines in the Northern Territory for around six months at a time. Over a number of years, we intend to build on this relationship in a staged way to a full force of around 2,500 personnel that is a full marine air ground task force. A second component of these initiatives which we have agreed is greater access by US military aircraft to the Royal Australian Air Force facilities in our country's north. This will involve more frequent movements of US military aircraft into and out of northern Australia. Although surprising to those who keep only a casual eye on the headlines from the region, the announcement came as no surprise to those who have been watching the United States increasingly focusing its attention on the region, and even openly declaring the Asia-Pacific as one of the two main anticipated areas of operation for American armed forces in the coming decades. What will happen in Asia in the years ahead will have an enormous impact on our nation's future and we cannot afford to sit on the sidelines and leave it to others to determine our future for us. The uh, Asia-Pacific region is vital uh, to U.S. Uh, national security interests and will be so in the future. And we are absolutely uh, turning toward the Asia-Pacific uh, as a, a place where our strategic interests uh, are increasingly of importance. Our partnerships uh, with uh, partners in the, in the region are, are critical, and we're going to continue to invest uh, in those uh, relationships. In this century, the 21st century, the United States recognizes that our prosperity and our security depends even more on the Asia-Pacific region. Given these trends, President Obama has stated that the United States will play a larger role in this region over the decades to come. This effort will draw on the strengths of the entire United States government. We take on this role, not as a distant power, but as part of the Pacific family of nations. Our goal is to work closely with all of the nations in this region to confront common challenges and to promote peace, prosperity, and security for all nations in the Asia-Pacific region. The reason for this sudden shift in attention to America's western flank is obvious. China's precipitous rise in the past two decades as both an increasing economic and military power is seen as a direct threat to American interests in the region. In this context, the marine deployment in Darwin and the growing U.S. interest in locating naval bases and air bases for unmanned aerial vehicles in and around Australia's shores are almost universally read as an overt warning to Beijing and a step to counter China's recent naval aggressions in the South China Sea. This aspect of the recent marine deployment did not go unnoticed by political commentators on the region. I think the situation now 
has uh, already caught the attention of the Chinese Communist Party in the past three months. As far as I have observed some signs of discussion and debate within the Chinese government, the Chinese government has started to um, gain some consensus, uh, a perception that the US and China relations is being positioned in a zero-sum game. So look, this is the, there's only one thing about this whole thing, which is encircling, if not harassing China, or the other way around, rather harassing. It starts with these 2,500 Marines in Darwin, north of Australia. Australia and the US, they are discussing uh, a closer collaboration in a naval base in Perth, in Western Australia. Then there's the Malacca Strait, through which China imports oil from the Middle East, especially from Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a plan to close their cooperation with Singapore as well and stationing of U.S. warships, more station of war U.S. warships in Singapore. Then there's the Philippines, plans for more rotational troops based in the Philippines. Then there's Guam, east of the Philippines more war american warships and more troops as well there are around 4500 at the moment they want to double it and then don't forget there's japan 40000 us troops south korea 28500 us troops plus roving us troops in the north china sea and near the sea of japan 16500 <laughs> so this is rather a fantastic welcoming committee to emergence of China as a great superpower. But the Chinese know it. They know this is about American control of the Western Pacific and the South China Sea. And they will have their countermeasures in place, of course. As if to reinforce these points, within months of the first company of U.S. Marines arriving in Darwin, they began participating in joint training with the Malaysian, Thai, and Indonesian militaries. This growing trend toward militarization of the Asia-Pacific has been reflected in a number of stories from the region over the past several months. Earlier this week, Australian Foreign Minister Bob Carr had to issue a formal denial that the U.S. was seeking a permanent military base in Australia in the face of persistent and widespread speculation to the contrary. Also in the past week, the U.S. had to issue its own denial that its recently unveiled plans to expand the missile defense capabilities of its radar facilities in southern Japan were in fact aimed at China. Despite the fact that the upgraded X-band early warning radar is well outside of the range of Pyongyang's mil military capability, the U.S. State Department issued a formal statement last week that the missile defenses were in fact aimed at North Korea, not Beijing. The Indian Ocean has likewise come under increasing scrutiny after the crash of an MQ-9 Reaper drone in the Seychelles last year forced the P Pentagon to admit what many had long surmised, that the U.S. had a drone base on the island and was using it as a staging base for operations in East Africa including Yemen and Somalia. As this activity continues to increase, Australia looks set to become an increasingly important strategic ally of the American interests in the Asia-Pacific. If so, all indications so far seem to suggest that the Australian government will be only too happy to cooperate with Washington on achieving its security goals, as it has been for the past 61 years under the ANZUS Treaty. Last week I had the chance to talk to Barack West, an Australian blogger who is keeping an eye on developments in the region at his website, Asia Pacific Perspective, about the, these developments and how the Australian people are responding to this new militarization of their neighborhood. So what's your perspective there on the ground in Australia? What, what are people saying, thinking, or, or it, it, are they really coming around or changing their viewpoint over what's taken place recently, or is this just kind of background? I wish I could say they were, but yeah, this is kind of background. There was a bit of not really opposition to it, but it definitely made the, made the papers when um, when the uh, Obama and the administration came down here uh, late last year. Um, but in the general sense of the Australian public, this isn't really seen as a as a, a negative thing at all. You know, it's just it's a it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. It's just kind of the way it is. It, the way it is. You know, it's the way it always has been since, you know, the World Wars and, uh, you know, there's no real push or anything to change that anytime soon, it, it would seem, which right. I think is the same. I'm not, of course, I'm not here waving a Chinese flag or anything, but I, I just think it's important to question these alliances, especially when, you know, 
our place in the region is going to become that much more important and, uh, and volatile in the coming decades. Uh, and that's such an important point that you just made, because once again, we can be shoved into that dialectic. Well, if we're against uh, the US-Australia alliance, then we must want some Chinese, greater Chinese alliance. Well, no, what if we don't want either side of that poison pie? And uh, you have a, a related video posted up here, uh, no need to choose sides between China and US. I haven't had a chance to watch that yet, but I'm assuming that's roughly along the lines of what we're saying here. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, surprisingly, this is actually from our new foreign minister, uh, Bob Carr, um, who who used to be the New South Wales uh, Premier for uh, quite some time. Um, there has been a small amount of debate about, you know, Australia's relationship with, uh, you know, between the US and China and if we're just some kind of conduit bridge to, you know, uh, for these two countries to kind of uh, communicate. Um, and we've had Hugh White uh, come out, who was a... Uh, uh, or a professor, I believe, and also former Prime Minister Paul Keating come out saying that America needs to accept that China is a uh, rising superpower and, uh, and, then, and that, you know, uh, it needs to kind of stand down its uh, aggressive military stance that it's, you know, pretty much been its only trump card for the last couple of decades. So, yeah, uh, that video is pretty much, he's just pretty much saying there is no real uh, need to choose sides because we have this kind of balance at the moment. But... I don't know if uh, the Chinese and the Americans see it exactly the same way. It is far too early to say what form the conflicts and battles of the 21st century will take, but that many of them will take place in the Asia-Pacific region seems an increasing likelihood. Although it's still only a blip on the political radar of many Australians, they are likely to find themselves in the coming years in an increasingly precarious position as their political leaders plunge them into an ever-deepening relationship with the Pentagon. Right now, it remains a question if the Australian people will take this responsibility seriously and begin pushing back against the growing militarization of the region, or if Canberra and Washington will be allowed to continue expanding their military cooperation unimpeded and push the world one step closer to outright confrontation with China. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.